the 24th of February, 1994, the last night Fred and Rose would spend together after 22 years of marriage and the start of a murder investigation that would shock the world. Fred West, a builder in his 50s, worked hard to pay for his house in the center of Gloucester, where he lived with his devoted wife, Rose, and their children. These were people who were well regarded. I mean, they weren't highly regarded, but at least well regarded by most of those around them. A bit eccentric, a bit odd, but do anything for you. Summer 1969. Rose was waiting for a bus when Fred first saw her. She was almost 16, and Fred was 28. Fred tracked Rose down to the cafe where she waitressed. Thick, certain, strong, the son of a farm laborer, Fred got his way with the women he pursued. Soon, Rose was Fred's lover and pregnant with their first daughter, Heather. Over 20 years later, and Heather had been missing for seven years. Allegations of sexual abuse within the West family alerted Gloucestershire police to Heather's disappearance. After an initial search failed to locate her, Detective Superintendent John Bennett was brought in to investigate. What that basically meant was that uh, either she had gone abroad uh, illegally because she wouldn't have had a passport uh, or was dead. The police search quickly centred on the West's house in Cromwell Street. It was some form of a family joke that Heather was under the patio of Cromwell Street. This being mentioned mostly by Fred and Rose West to their children when they'd done something wrong, hadn't eaten their food or refused to go to bed or be naughty in some way. On the 24th of February, the police moved in to search Fred West's garden. He was saying that there was no truth in this and that he was going to sue the police uh, for the damage they were causing to his home. Slab by slab, the police removed Fred's patio. They found nothing at first. Then, digging deeper, something caught their eye. It was a bone, but was it human? They called in forensic pathologist Professor Bernard Knight to find out. And it was obvious that, you know, two seconds it was a, a human thigh bone and female and young. Fred had broken a sewer pipe at some stage in his digging. So I was digging through a mixture of uh, Gloucester clay and, of course, the sewage, so it was a sort of black, sticky mess. But then, when I went into this hole, or at least, I think there's a police officer down there, and he handed up some bits. Uh, and I looked at these, I remember looking, I think, at <laughs> Inspector Bennett and saying, well, either she's got three legs or you've got more than one. The police had found the remains of two bodies. They suspected one was Heather, but who else was under the patio? The police confronted Fred. Fred made a staggering confession. Not only Heather, but two other women were buried in the garden. One had a name. He said she was Shirley Robinson, his secret lover, and pregnant with his child. The thing I want to stress, I mean, is Rose doesn't know anything at all. She hasn't done anything. The other, he claimed, was Shirley's mate. The police needed more information, but Fred kept changing his story. One minute he was making admissions, the next minute he was denying that he had done any of these murders and it was somebody else. She's not going to let me say to her, I strangled Heather without coming straight to the police. Don't get Rose wrong. Rose lived by the law. Properly, I mean. But all the time, whenever he returned to making his admissions, he would reinforce that his wife knew nothing of these crimes at all, that they were purely down to him. Was it possible that Rose knew nothing about the murders? Three young women killed and buried under her nose, including her daughter, Heather. Cromwell Street was turning out to be no ordinary family home. In 1994, 
One of the biggest criminal investigations in Britain began in an ordinary house in Gloucester. The remains of three young women had been recovered from under the patio at 25 Cromwell Street. One of the victims, Heather, was the teenage daughter of builder Fred West, who'd confessed to all three murders. Now, Fred had started to change his story. But in one thing he was consistent. His wife, Rose, knew nothing about the murders. I know she doesn't like the law, but she'll not have it broken. He even started to converse with the officers off tape, almost suggesting that uh, he wasn't guilty of murder, he was guilty of manslaughter, that uh, he would be out soon, um, that this would all be some big tragic accident that he would portray. Was this a case of manslaughter, as Fred claimed, or were his quick confessions masking something far more sinister? Evidence found with a third victim pointed to murder. One of them had a black plastic or leather belt with a buckle, again put round under the chin and over the top of the head. Of course, because all the soft tissues had gone, everything had sort of moved a bit and fallen about, but it was obvious that this was a, some kind of bondage thing on the head. But who was the third victim? All the police knew was what Fred had told them. She was the friend of his secret lover, Shirley Robinson, the second victim found at Cromwell Street. It was obvious it was going to be hard to identify these bodies because the bones themselves never give you any clue as to who the person is, not the bones. Usually it's the face, the skull and the teeth. And of course that's the province of uh, Professor Whittaker. There is more information in your teeth about you and your lifestyle and your age and possibly even how you died than there is in most other parts of your body. Especially if the body is decomposed and the soft tissues have gone, the teeth are still there. To help the police, Professor Whitaker needed photographs of likely victims. Providing we can get a photograph of them smiling and showing their teeth, those teeth have an incredible amount of information in them in terms of height, tilt, roundedness, all of these which will show up in a, in a good photograph. And so we assess those in the laboratory and then we sort of fuse simply a photograph that comes in to me from the police with an image of the person's skull. And if we've got it right, it sort of goes click. But how could the police provide photographs when they didn't have a name for one of the victims? Unsolved missing persons files were reopened. Names began to emerge. Winter 1968. Mary Bastholm, a young waitress, went missing from a bus stop in Gloucester. Five years later, a young student, Lucy Partington, vanished from another bus stop, this time in nearby Cheltenham. Was it possible one of them was the third victim buried at Cromwell Street? Or could they both be there? Forensic psychologist Paul Britton was brought in to profile Fred West and answer the burning question, were there other victims? I was in a position where I had paperwork that went back 20, 30 years. And as I began to look at that, then the bells began to ring rather grimly for me. Because what I began to see were some of the hallmarks, the highlights of a very dangerous offender not at all the man that I'd been told might be sitting downstairs. My view was that all that had happened is you had simply seen three high points and that it was very unlikely, unthinkable really, that you were going to have silences across the intervening years. The time between those three marks was going to be filled with other sorts of murder, other sorts of killing. A man 
will appear in court this morning following the discovery of three bodies in his back garden. 52-year-old Fred West from Gloucester is accused of murdering the women, including his 16-year-old daughter Heather, who disappeared in 1987. I listened to the news and I just went straight back to 1972 and I was there again and I remembered those words, you know, bury me under the paving stones. There's hundreds of girls and I thought paving stones, patio, same thing. Caroline Roberts looked after Heather when she worked for the Wursts as a nanny. Deeply disturbed by news of her death, she rang the police to offer a statement. That night I couldn't sleep at all. I knew the police were coming in. I was trying to remember all the things that I took 22 years trying to forget. Um, and it was so vivid that in the end I, I had to get up in the middle of the night and I just wrote everything down. <laughs> It was haunting for me because I really felt responsible for their deaths. It was almost like they were my family. I knew them all intimately, and I think that's because I know up to a point I shared the same experience as them. Another call to the police, this time from a friend of the parents of Linda Goff, a girl who had gone missing in 1973 and whose last known address was 25 Cromwell Street. New information started to emerge. During the course of looking for her, Mrs. Goff had gone to the address and been told by a woman and her husband, Linda, had left some time previously. Linda's mother had noticed that Rose was wearing her daughter's slippers if this was the case, and Linda was one of Fred's victims, it was possible Rose knew about the murders. She's not here. He was also wearing a cardigan or some uh, knitted clothing that was Linda's. And outside, on a wordy gig type uh, washing line, was some of Linda's nightwear. The Wests told Mrs. Goff that Linda had moved on, leaving some of her things behind. Believing their story, but unable to locate Linda, June Goff waited for her daughter's return. Years went by, but Linda never came back. Caroline Roberts first met the West six months before Linda moved in. In her statement to the police, Caroline recalled in chilling detail how the West selected their potential victims. This one night I was at Chiking Back from Tewkesbury on my own, and this car pulled up. Um, with two people in, and this was Fred and Rose West. When I first got in there, I didn't think they were a couple because of the age difference and the fact that she was quite an attractive young girl and he was not an attractive man. As we went on our way back towards Cinderford, we got talking and they seemed really friendly and that's when I found out they'd just got married and that they had um, three little girls. And they, they were talking to me and asking me about what I was doing and that. And I said that I tried to avoid being at home as much as possible because of my stepdad. We kind of just didn't get on. And with that, they both at the same time just turned around and said, hey, would you like to come and work with us, looking after our children? And within a week of meeting them, I moved in to 25 Cromwell Street. Caroline's job would be to look after Heather, newly born baby May, and Anna Marie, the oldest child from Fred's first failed marriage. One of the strange things was that they had a lot of visitors, mainly men, coming to the house. Um, and I used to look after the children while Rose was with these men. And I'm sure she must have told me she was mas a masser, which I believed at that time. There was an even darker side to Fred. He'd, he'd tell me um, things like he'd performed abortions. Oh, don't worry if you get pregnant, Caroline. You know, we can put you right. I can do abortions. I've done abortions before now. And, he, he, and the sickening thing was that he would say things like, yeah, and the women were so grateful they'd offer their bodies to me straight after. Which, yeah, and I, I thought, nah, this man's just making it all up. He ain't right. Shortly after, Caroline left Cromwell Street, hoping never to return. But Fred and Rose had other plans for her. 
For Paul Britton, Caroline Roberts' statement made one thing clear. The house was the key. To understand the Wests fully and what went on inside their home, he needed to visit the crime scene. He needed to visit Cromwell Street. It was an ordinary house. It was one of a row. It was the end one, as I recall, and I think its neighbor on one side was a church. The church walls made the boundary on one side of the house. Going up the stairs, they're quite steep, but as you turn round on the back of the doorway and the, the bit above the doorway, there is a full-length picture of a woman, very reminiscent of the younger um, Rosemary, beckoning. Disturbing details of the West's lives started to emerge. Bedrooms Rose used for prostitution fitted with listening and recording devices so that Fred could watch. But most significant of all for Britain was the cellar. This part of the house was quite self-contained. Um, people could go about whatever they did there, being reasonably sure that they weren't going to be disturbed. If you came in through the back way, you'd have to come in through kitchens in a bathroom area, and to get to where we are now is quite an intricate little route. So you're not going to be disturbed. There are no external windows. The brickwork is quite thick. You are in the lower part of the foundation of the house. So that, if you like, is the... Um, it, it, it serves a joint function. It's the ultimate pleasure room, but it's also the working room. It's, it's the room where these dreadful things are done. He told the police to move their search inside the house. I mean, the words, in a way, were clumsy, but I mean, they're in the garden because the house is already full. Paul Britton had said that West was a predatory sexual psychopath. Um, and he had said quite clearly that there was a possibility of there being more victims. I'm saying now that you are facing something that you have never, ever seen before, and probably very few of your colleagues have seen, and you really don't want to see it. The police began to search the cellar for more victims. Fred was told they had moved inside the house. He was also questioned about Linda Goff and why Rose had been wearing her clothes. Fred refused to answer. Just after half past five that afternoon, uh, I received a phone call from the cell block to say that uh, Howard Ogden, the solicitor who was representing West, had asked to see me urgently. When he arrived, he appeared quite pale, and uh, I remember he asked me if I'd like to sit down. I wish to admit to a further approx nine killings. It was something that just seemed to be beyond belief. Nine killings. Completely unexpected, out of the blue. Expressly. Charmaine, Rena. Beyond my personal experience. Linda Goff. And I suspect that of many other police officers. And others to be identified. I even questioned whether, uh, personally, I was capable of handling this. F. Officers in Gloucester searching 25 Cromwell Street have today discovered what they believe to be another set of human remains. Everybody wanted to know what was going on. Christened the Angel of Cromwell Street, Hilary Allison became the voice of the police investigation. But with global press interest growing by the second, Hilary had her hands full. 
my recollection is is walking out to give a briefing and suddenly having cameras flashing all over the place questions being asked of you microphones thrust in your face and what we had to try and do was manage that and say come on folks be reasonable questions one at a time we will read a statement out for you we will do some interviews with you individually afterwards if you want it but please can you just back back i'd come down cromwell street and the place looked like uh, I don't know what it looks like, a football match with uh, Japanese photographers and at one occasion the police had had barriers up and they sort of burst through at one occasion it was almost crushed against the wall. It was a bit off-putting when you're just trying to go to work. <laughs> We had a number of calls from reporters all over the country, national and, and local, saying, well, we've now heard it's going to be 32 bodies, it's going to be 69 bodies. We've heard that Fred West has fathered 32 children. All sorts of um, things were being put to us. Now, of course, all we could say at that stage was, look, this is pure speculation. No one has mentioned those figures. As soon as we get any information, we'll give it to you. Um, but we certainly can't get into the business of speculating. Whatever the press imagined, the police now knew there were 12 victims. Three had been identified, Heather, Shirley Robinson, and now Alison Chambers, who Fred had wrongly claimed was Shirley's maid. I wish to admit... Fred had also confessed to a further nine murders, including his first wife, Rena Costello, and her daughter, Charmaine. But where were Lucy Partington and Linda Goff? Were they buried in the cellar? or hidden in the walls of 25 Cromwell Street. And if they were, how could Fred's wife, Rose, not know about the murders? Fred told the police there were other bodies in other places. He led them to Much Markle near Gloucester, the tiny rural village where he grew up. This field's known locally as uh, Letterbox Field. When we brought him out here, hoping that he could identify the location where he buried the body. We were very fortunate that within four days of starting excavations here, we did recover human remains. Um, and those were subsequently identified as being of uh, Rena Costello, Fred's uh, first wife. Now, she hadn't been seen since 1971, so the uh, body had been in the ground for more than 20 years. But there was something else something detectives hadn't bargained for. Fred revealed that lying close by was another body, Rena's friend, Anne McFall, who, like Shirley Robinson, had also been pregnant with his child. At the time that we believe the body was buried, the field was completely different. There was a, a small pond down there, and more than that, the farmer had told us that he'd added about eight or nine feet of soil above the original level. We spent two months here digging out a huge amount of ground. In fact, the hole was the size of an Olympic-sized swimming pool. We'd done all this work, and we were almost on the point of closing the operation down when we finally discovered the, uh, the, the remains. The recovery of the, uh, the remains of Anne McFall was rather poignant here because we believed that she was probably the first victim of, of Fred West, and she was the last one to be found. Inside West's home at Cromwell Street, the police search was also reaching a conclusion. Inch by inch, they'd stripped the house bare. Five more unknown victims had been painstakingly exhumed from the basement. And in the bathroom, they finally found the remains of Linda Goff. Cromwell Street was empty at last. With nothing left to find and the media demanding information, the next task for the police was to identify the victims. This onerous task lay in one man's hands. Professor Whitaker was making progress with a skull from the cellar with a distinctive clue to its identity. This girl must have had some damage to her two front teeth. They had crowns on them. These crowns were temporary crowns. Now, to a dentist, this means she had an accident, probably. She had the work done to make new crowns. She had temporary ones put on, and she died, and was unable to go back for that fitting. The precision of Whitaker's observations led a police colleague to ask him an unlikely question. She remembered an incident from a hockey match many years before, 
when a local girl had her teeth knocked out, and she asked if it could be the same girl. We had, I don't know, 10,000 missing girls in Britain. They were in the frame. And a woman police detective says, do you think it could be this girl who was playing hockey? And of course the answer has to be, it's incredibly unlikely, but we ought to check it out. The team was put on to sort this out and it turned out to be her. I realised that Lucy wouldn't be dead if she hadn't been a female and if she hadn't been collided in this most extraordinary and incomprehensible way with the world of the West that was the complete opposite of her life. The girl who'd once played hockey was Lucy Partington. After 20 years of waiting, Marion could lay her sister to rest. She asked the police if she could see Lucy's remains. I just walked forward and took the lid off and there it was and there was something about the shape of it that was just immediately I knew that it was Lucy's skull. It was just like the shape of this dome. I told my mum what we were going to do and I said, is there anything you'd like me to put in with Lucy's bones? And she gave me these two old toys of Lucy's that she'd always kept that we played with as children, completely beaten up old, old straw-stuffed lion that was called Chocker and another one that was called Bunny who was dressed up in his smart velvet trousers. We put Chocker and Bunny in either side of her skull and wrapped it all up, you know, it was like tucking up what was left. It really helped to make it real. I'd been away from the West House for about a month. Um, and then on December the 6th, I was hitchhiking back from Tewkesbury again in exactly the same spot that they'd picked me up what, five weeks earlier? When they pulled up, they were both sat in the front and Rose um, opened the window, the passenger side, and was all smiling. And um, then she said, uh, oh, Caroline, I'm so glad to see you. I'm really sorry about what happened. Um, and then Fred leaned across and he was all smiling and said, I'm really sorry, Karen, didn't mean to upset you like that. I was only joking. And then they were, like, talking and saying, oh, the kids have really missed you and we really missed you. And I kind of felt like... Even though I didn't want to get in the car, I kind of felt like they were being so nice that I had to. Come on. OK, thanks. Can you sit in the back, Fred? Have a chat with Carolyn. About two miles into that journey, Fred looked at me in the rearview mirror and asked me if I'd had um, sex. And I just had this feeling come up in my stomach and felt sick, and I thought, oh, here we go again. Check it and see. Check and see if she, she's had sex. And with that, she grabbed my crutch. Fred pulled up on the grass verge and turned around in his seat and just kept punching me across the side of the head. And I, I was knocked out. When I came through, they'd um, tied my hands behind my back with my scarf um, and they were wrapping, like, parcel tape all, all around my head. They were telling me, if you just calm down, we're just going to make you a cup of tea, tidy your back up and then we're going to take you home. And they did do that. They they sat me down and they 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 took the tape off me, um, and did my hands and gave me a cup of tea, gave me a cigarette to try and calm me down. And I did then think, oh, this is okay. They've just made a mistake. Uh, they think I'm something I'm not, and I'm going to go home. Um, and a few minutes later, after we'd finished a cup of tea, uh, Rose grabbed hold of me and tried to kiss me on the mouth. These are people, the Wests,
probably got more joy, more satisfaction, more fulfillment out of what they did, these poor girls, than anything else in their entire existence. And the fact that they did it together heightened the value and the pleasure to them. Fred was mostly watching. And then it progressed a bit further. Um, and then they were both interfering with me. Um, and, and discussing my gen genitals. And Fred was saying that there was something abnormal about my genitals. But not to worry, because he could put that right. If you look at what happened to her, you see the antecedents, you see the, uh, the script, if you like, for many of the things that were to come later and to be enacted with the victims who were murdered most terribly. And so they decide to stop and, right, we'll calm you back down now, we're going to take you home soon. Get me another cup of tea, take my gag out while I have this cup of tea, and then and scrap, and then it starts again. The Wests used her for their immediate sexual gratification. That was important to them. They, they raped her, they dominated her, they controlled her. But remember, even at this stage, they were not in a hurry. They didn't expect to uh, kill her necessarily, but neither did they expect her to be gone from them very soon. One of their weaknesses, one of their areas of um, being blinkered is not really to understand that other people really are sentient, active people. And that means if they can get away, they will. If they can oppose, they will. And so I tried to shout out, Rose put a pillow over my head and smothered me. First I was kind of, kind of struggling with it and then I thought, no. Just go with it. You know, you kind of give up. And it's just so easy to just let it go, just go off to sleep, and that's it, it's over with. Fred came back and pulled the pillow off me, and that's when they um, ripped me up by my neck. And that's when they threatened to kill me. Um, they said, and they were, I had both these faces offering over me. Um, and they said, um, we're going to keep you in the salon and we're going to let our black friends use you. And when they finished with you, we're going to kill you. And we're going to bury you under this paving stones of Gloucester. And he, he added that, you know, there are, there are hundreds of girls buried there. The police haven't found them and they're not going to find you. <laughs> Caroline was not alone. Evidence found with the remains of the West's victims suggested they'd been through something similar before their lives had been ended. We found one knife. It couldn't have been the knife that dismembered them because it was a long bread knife type, which was a bit round-ended. It couldn't be used for that. And the other things, of course, were uh, bondage materials, I suppose you'd call them. They were sort of masks of sticky tape, Get her up. stuff you tape on parcels wrapped around the head, and some plastic tubes which had been pushed up nostrils. Pretty bizarre stuff. Remember, if you look at what happened to these young women, you see a progression of, of debasement, of mutilation. You see uh, physical mutilation. All of these things are much more enjoyable when they can be repeated in discussion, in shared memory, after the event. And this would be an area where Rosemary, for Frederick West, would be absolutely vital. She had enormous value to him. In 1972, Caroline Roberts was raped, abducted, and nearly murdered by Fred and Rosemary West. They spared Caroline after she promised to stay silent about her ordeal. She slipped away at the first opportunity and went to the police. Still traumatized, Caroline was unable to face a rape trial, so the police charged the Wests with indecent assault. Fred and Rose were released with a 100 pound fine. I think the most shocking aspect of the West case is that it ever got 
to being um, a set of serial killers plying their trade. Everything that we know about the Wests was evident in that first case that went before the magistrates all those years ago. Instead of serving a prison term for rape, the Wests were free to murder Linda Goff, Lucy Partington, and Carol Ann Cooper before the year was out. From Caroline's statement, it was clear to the police that Fred and Rose were in it together. She's a perfect mother. Fred had been lying to protect Rose, who was still protesting her innocence. Now under arrest, Rose was summoned to the magistrate's court where she would be charged jointly with Fred for nine counts of murder. In court, Rose would be reunited with her husband. On each occasion, she snubbed him, uh, looked away from him, didn't accept his attempt at touching her or advances. And this clearly quite perturbed him. Rejected and dismayed, Fred wrote Rose a letter. Well, Rose, it's your birthday. You'll be 41. It's still beautiful, it's still lovely. On New Year's Day, around one o'clock. We'll always be in love. The most wonderful thing in the world was when I met you. West using parts cut from prison blanket and making a very neat snake-like rolled rope, which he very neatly blanket stitched. I haven't got you a present. All I have is my life. I was asked by the investigators, you know, did I think there was any risk that um, the Wests might kill themselves or hurt themselves in an attempt to uh, avoid justice or if they tried to escape or uh, what their defence might be. And my view was very clear that Rosemary West, um, certainly before a trial, would never make any admissions. That although it it hadn't been anticipated by folks years before. She, psychologically, was much stronger, much more intact than Frederick West ever was. She would not say anything. Frederick West was very different. If he learned that Rosemary was, in fact, repudiating him, then he would almost certainly try to kill himself. And Rosemary began to repudiate him, and so he killed himself. Fred took the truth with him to the grave. And with no evidence linking Rose directly to the murders, it looked as if the Wests could escape justice. 25 Midland Road, the Wests' former home. Sit on the couch. Under cheap kitchen linoleum lay the body of a child. She had been there for over two decades until the police recovered her. Eight-year-old Charmaine was Fred's stepdaughter. Her mother, Rena Costello, had been murdered by Fred and buried in a field at Much Markle. Charmaine had last been seen in 1971, the year Fred spent nine months in prison, leaving Charmaine in Rose's care. If it could be shown that he was in prison when this unfortunate child died, who was murdered, then he clearly couldn't have done it. And Rosemary had a problem. It was the vital evidence the police needed to convict Rose. But there was a hitch. The police couldn't find a photograph of Charmaine that showed her teeth. Without it, Professor Whitaker couldn't determine the date of her death. And without a date, Rose West would get away with murder. Before he killed himself, Fred West confessed to the murder of 12 women. Nine were found at Cromwell Street, and now two more burial sites had been uncovered. Rena Costello, Fred's first wife, and her friend, Anne McFall, had been found under the fields at Much Markle. And now Charmaine, Fred's eight-year-old stepdaughter, was being exhumed from 25 Midland Road. With Fred West dead, and no evidence to link Rose directly to murder, it looked like the Wests could escape justice. The police needed to convict Rose of murder. They needed to prove their hunch that Rose killed Charmaine while Fred was in prison. To prove this, the police had to find a photograph of Charmaine showing her teeth. So Professor Whitaker could match it to her skull 
and work out the date of her death. Well, I, I was actually sort of almost in despair. The, the, the really sort of professional answer that I wanted to be able to give, or well, two professional answers, who is it and when did she die, I couldn't answer either of them. Then Professor Whitaker had a stroke of luck. A fax intended for Rose West's defence team was sent to him by mistake. I couldn't believe it. Out came, not a kind of sort of document, you know, which I could sort of look away from and, you know, turn it over and take away. It was a photograph. And it kept coming out, you know, as faxes do, and it came bigger and bigger and bigger. It was the photograph of Charmaine Weiss that we'd been looking for for months and months and months. The police were also able to locate the photographer, who not only remembered the session, but also had a record of the date he'd taken it. This was the breakthrough they needed. Now that they had a reference point, Professor Whitaker could measure the amount of growth in Charmaine's teeth between the time the photo was taken and the point where growth had stopped. This gave him a probable date for Charmaine's death. The police had proved their hunch. Fred was in prison at the time. Finally, the case against Rose was building. Now they had a jury to convince. Rose West's trial began in Winchester in October 1995. Accused of 10 counts of murder, she pleaded not guilty to all charges. The prosecution needed an ace card. Caroline Roberts was asked to take the stand. I thought, right, you know, I'm an adult now. Back then, I couldn't have handled it, but now I can handle this. I'm going to do it. What had happened to me had happened to these girls, and I wanted to at least get justice for them. And this time, I didn't care what anybody said or thought about me. I was going in there, and I was going to stand up to them. I knew she wasn't innocent. When I was attacked, the nearest I came to death was at her hands. And so I, I knew she was capable of murder. Had the combination of Caroline's strong witness statement and Professor Whitaker's evidence from the photograph helped to swing the jury. The jury came back. Rose West was found guilty on 10 counts of murder. The trial judge, in sentence her, said she should never be released. She is always, from that time, and continues to do so, maintain her innocence. Juanita Mott, Therese Siegenthal. Linda, if I know that Rosemary West was sexually abused as a child by her father, and I know that when she was 15, she was abducted from a, a bus stop and raped, and that four years later, when she was 19, that's what happened to Lucy. Catherine Costello, and I Gradually, as the years have gone by, I've, I've felt more compassion for her. Lucy Partington. And I do hope that something of her life can be healed. The thing about Rosemary West is that she was, in effect, a blank canvas. And the thing that Frederick West did was to provide a platform to provide a runway that she flew from. He was able to nurture her, to encourage her, to, if you like, show her the way. What he didn't anticipate, I'm quite sure, but was enormously gratified by was the fact that she flew past him. In 1996, the police supervised a five-day demolition of 25 Cromwell Street. Speculation about other bodies, other possible victims of the Wests never found by the police, continues to this day.